Hello Internet and welcome back to a Casual Review. And today we're going to talk about a book that I really loved a lot, The Book of Woe and the Unmaking of Psychiatry. And basically this book by Gary Greenberg is, I think, a must read for anyone that's interested in psychology, not just psychodynamics, but really psychology and psychiatry on the whole. Because it talks about one of the most crucial and maybe the, one of the most influential books of our discipline, which is the DSM-5 and 4 and 3, which are the precursors. And what you have to understand is that in this book, which is incredibly well written, Gary Rubinberg really has a, has a gift for writing, I felt. Um, because I don't read that fast, and basically I read it in like a week, and like at the fair with the book, so... Good points for him. He he he's, he has a brilliant plume, we would say in French, meaning a brilliant style of writing. Anyway, so this book is basically a criticism of the DSM-5, but also of how it was made. So for you people that don't know, the DSM is like a basis. I wouldn't say it's a Bible because it's gotten a lot of criticism by a lot of people. But it's so enormous in the world of psychology and psychiatry that it's just unavoidable. And what is it? So it's just basically a list of criteria. Like, let's say, if, you're the, if you can't sleep, if you're having mood troubles, if you, for example, can't concentrate, or you might fall in into depression diagnostic criteria. It's a, it's a generalized sin, but it's for you to understand that it's basically just like a list of symptoms. It doesn't go in into the why, into the how to deal with it. It's just really um, basic uh, assessment tool, which in of itself would be okay, I suppose. But the problem is that a lot of people give it much, much more value than it really has. What that mean by that, and what especially Greenberg means by that, is that basically it isn't that easy and all-encompassing structure and book. It is very biased. Um, psychiatrists disagree, even in the committees that make the book, that write the book, they disagree, there's a lot of internal fights. The scientificity of it is very questionable. And when I mean that, I, I don't mean that in that pseudo way. No, it's really, really questionable. Like, for example, certain diagnostic criteria have been excluded because they were not good enough or there was too many people that were suffering from it. For example, uh, Asperger's syndrome was replaced by the all-encompassing autistic spectrum disorder, which is the whole spectrum. Because for you, for you people that don't know, before, basically, there were two big categories of autistic people. Very schematic, very, I mean, this is a, a, a generalization that's a bit too wide, wide, but I think it's interesting to point it out. Basically, before there was Kenna autism, and they were, which was the non-verbal, pseudo-verbal, those that had a lot of stereotypies in their speech, those, those people that had repetitive behavior, etc., etc., and the Asperger syndrome, which was the high-end, quote-unquote, even if I don't like the term, but the people that could function within society with more minimal adaptation than those that were on the Kenna side of sins. And the thing is that they've completely brushed aside both in the new in the new DSM. That's what Gary Greenberg points out. And the thing is that you might think, well, it's true, it's a spectrum, I mean, but the real reason why they did it, the true to the core reason, was that it was a problem with the insurances. Too many people were getting diagnosed with Asperger syndrome disorder, and the insurances were not happy with that. And basically, also, the psychiatrists were very dubious towards the fact that basically people were autistic. For them, they were just being obsessive compulsive, and that's pretty much it. And they were over exaggerating that autistic side of themselves, which is terrible when you think about it. That basically they they kind of cut a whole diagnostic criteria just for the just to make it look good. And there's also the problem of biological um, illnesses because the problem with the DSM is that basically it wants itself to be like this book of medicine, like ailments and the problem is they're never going to the cause nor the treatment nor even the way of thinking about it it's really just a list of basic criteriums and 
there was one that could have fit in perfectly, which was melancholia, meaning that it's basically a form of sadness, at least in English, because in French they have a different definition. Yeah, no, confusing. But in English, melancholia is basically the idea that you're, when you don't sleep, you tend to get more frustrated much quicker. You tend to not be able to think straight, being sad, upset, um, this, even feeling a lot of despair because of the lack of sleep, basically. And they chose to kick it out um, during the making of the DSM because they felt that it made the others look bad. The other diagnosis that didn't have a biological case. And I found that when Gary Greenberg talks about it, like, oh my God, I mean, how can they do that? Just because it looks something else look bad. I mean, it's terrible, really, when you think about it. And that's not the only example. There's also the example of, and he goes into it, and I felt it was wonderful for that, is that he goes into a lot of details in regards to diagnosis. Is it really important to get a diagnosis? Has it really value? And is it even scientific? Because the big problem is that you might think, oh, well, there's such brilliant people talking. Uh, there's also a lot of narcissistic wars within those people talking. So, I mean, everyone wants to stay part of the pie, basically, and they're all fighting each other to get their diagnosis pushed through. And basically, there's a lot of problems. And he goes in into one of those very concrete problems, was that in the 2000s, early 2000s, children and teenagers were being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and they were prescribed medication. And that backfired terribly. And Birdman, which is the leader of that movement that wanted to push, he basically just accepted a bribe from the pharmaceutical industry. And it was pointed out that he basically pushed that agenda because he was paid for it. And Greenberg goes into a lot of detail about this. And it becomes terrible because you also see that the pharmaceutical industry has a vested interest in the DSM and in the making of the DSM, which means that it's not free from bias. It's not Basically, it's not there to help. And he goes into the detail that a long time ago, the DSM was psychodynamic, which I assume poses a lot of problems because those new, the new approaches we use, we use don't necessarily take influence from it, or at least not directly, which I understand completely. But the problem is that DSM, and he points that out, is a-theoretical, meaning that you're not going to find any fairies on the human mind. It's just this, 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 that, this, this, and this, that. And the massive problem is that in terms of a society the, and the psychological and psychiatrical world, we have taken this book as a basically as a given, as maybe not the Bible, but almost a Bible. And that's the big problem is that no, it's not some kind of Bible. It's just something that was created to make psychiatry look good, like a true doctor's discipline and not some kind of joke. Because for you people that might, who may not know, there's a big problem in psychiatry that it's not as easily seen. It cannot be diagnosed or seen through the body. And therefore, doctors in between themselves have always kind of looked down upon psychiatry. Psychiatry has always been considered like the lesser part of doctormanship or in the medical domain as like a lesser branch, a branch like, you know, the, like people that are not true doctors. I mean, it's complicated because that's a whole other topic. But you have to understand that psychiatry amongst the medical world is seen as a bit of like a joke. And as such, the DSM is that answer to try and look prestigious. There was even talk at the start of making everything in Latin to make it look more classy, right? And of course, they did not go with that, and thank God, because that would have been ridiculous. But the idea is basically it's trying to get back its lettre de noblesse, which means basically put it up a notch and to make it compete with the other disciplines of medicine. And the problem is that it has no way of competing because basically, as I've stated before in other videos, we are not, mental illness is not just some kind of biochemical mal malfunction. There's a lot of things intricate with existentialism, with subjectivity, with desire, with so much stuff like society's demand and how the individual copes with them. I mean, it's an incredibly vast and beautiful topic, but the problem is that it isn't shrinkable. And that no person is shrinkable. That's what makes this field beautiful. But it does pose a problem if you're going to go for 
criteria and diagnosis because there has to be a criteria. And the problem is that people often forget, I feel, that when they see a criteria like, oh, I'm depressed, or oh, I'm bipolar, or oh, I'm, I'm borderline. No, you're not really that. N never. You. It's just that it so happens to like come approximately close to something you're feeling. And that's the important part, you're feeling it. It's not some kind of etiquette. And that's the problem is that we are never a diagnosis. No one is a diagnosis. Even if like someone meets all the criteria, he isn't a diagnosis. And that's what I found great is that Greenberg does reaffirm this, that no, this book is like what it is. It's a flawed book on so many levels because of biases, because of ego wars, because basically the DSM wants to do be something that it shouldn't be. All of this combined makes it something that's just basically not helping our cause, but minimizing it, especially because in America, which is not the case in France where I work as a psychologist, the, basically the insurance company want to know what you're suffering from and how to and how you're dealing with it as a therapist. And therefore you have to have a diagnosis, but that's also a problem because, and so what? I mean, someone can be depressed and have sleep, sleep issues, anxiety. I mean, you can always put down something. That's not the problem. But the problem is that basically the person should never be limited to it. And the main issue is that the insurance companies in that world has made it into a frame of, oh, have to treat, you have to treat this, you have to go better, you have to as if it was medicine, and it's not, and it, and therapy isn't medical by nature, and if it was medical, I would never have taken an even the slightest interest into it. It's because it's a hybrid of philosophy, of emotions, of so, of society and sociology, and inner deep feelings, and also the unconscious mind, which is its whole set of worms, and all of that combined, and that's what makes it wonderful, but it cannot be reduced. And that's what Greenberg is really on about. He, through his investigations, through how he talks about it, shows how terrible it has become, how basically worthless on a clinical level it is, if you're not going to go for the insurance, how it doesn't help p clinicians think about their patients, but it just basically helps them box them in. And he does show also the dangers of that through what patient of his that he had and that was diagnosed with something like, I think it was borderline personality disorder, I'm pretty sure it was that, and how it had a massive impact on her because basically she did not consider herself like that, but then that's what the psychiatrist put in her diagnosis. And he also states that it's also shady because the kappa, which for you, the non people that don't know, the kappa is basically if things go one-to-one, -one. like for example, let's say if my cap is one with a colleague, that means we're always agreeing. And for all science, what is, con what is considered good is 0 0.8, meaning 80% of the time we agree. But for the DSM-5, I think it shoots down to like something terrible, like one one five. I mean, really something that should never happen. Like below five is only like, 50-50% chance, no better than chance, really. And he shows that basically the DSM is what it is. Without proper context, it's unusable. And it's not that good or not that important to follow it. And you have to understand that. And I think that's important for, to, for people to know, patient or clinician, that the DSM is not the be-all, end-all of psychology and psychiatry. These are things that are much more interesting. Feelings that need to be explored, experiences that need to be lived, but not in that boring and absolutely disgusting way of phrasing it, which is basically a list of symptoms. And to be fair to the DSM, it has brought some form of unity throughout the world, because beforehand, and in France, for example, it's very valid, that the fact beforehand, Every country had their kind of diagnosis, which is entertaining. I mean, I must admit, it's fun. But on the world scale, it was a bit confusing. Like, for example, psychose um, infantile in French, for example, meaning uh, infantile psychosis, was, was a diagnosis that was pretty prevalent. And what 
has happened to it. It's basically it's become basically um, a form of autism. From I'm simplifying it, but you get the gist. And the idea is that it's ultra confusing because when you come to one, you have to readapt because you don't know those diagnoses because they've been influenced by the country by how they see things. And invertly, when you, you leave that country and when you say to another colleague, well, here's infertility, people are lost. So kudos, at least now we all know what we're talking about in a way, but it does like limit conversations, at least clinical thinking, I think. Because when, once you said someone is X, like bipolar, borderline, depressed, anxious, yeah, well, what about it? It doesn't say anything, really. If not, that one specific condition is there, but it really doesn't tell us much. At least that's my feeling about it. And I felt that Greenberg was a, it was a wonderful read and really backs up the whole thing that we need to be more humane, more conscious of each other and more thorough in our therapies than just basically relying on a, on a book that's really not that great. So that was it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you ever want to leave a comment, please feel free. And if not, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.